Welcome to Out With Dan, the podcast that spotlights and examines the voices of LGBTQ plus authors, characters, and our allies. Together, we lift our voices and we tell our stories. I'm Dan White. Join me as I chat with this week's author. Hello and welcome back to Out With Dan. I am so excited to talk with Catherine Shellman again. It is wonderful to have you back again, Catherine. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Dan. I'm thrilled to be here once more. <laughs> Thank you. Last we talked, we talked about Last Call at the Nightingale, and you mentioned that you had another book, which is in a series, and it's the Lily Adler series. And this book is Death at the Manor. And it's publication day. Congratulations. Thank you. It's exciting to have two books in one summer. It's a new thing for me. Right? Look at you. I love that. So who is Lily Adler? So Lily Adler is a young widow living in Regency England. So it's sort of like Jane Austen time period. Um, and the, the vibe is kind of a I guess Agatha Christie meets Jane Austen because it's also a mystery. Um, and it's a it's would be cast categorized as a traditional mystery because it's got that amateur sleuth whodunit right. kind of feel. Um, but Lily is a, a young widow who in the first book in the series uh, was sort of trying to rebuild her life after the death of her husband and just sort of figure out like, okay, my my plan A is gone now. What is plan B? What is, what is life supposed to be for me right now? Which is hard to do when you are a woman alone in a society that expects women to either be you know, with their, with their parents, you know, still under the care of their parents or, you know, suitably married, <laughs> whatever suitably means for your station in life. That's right. And, you know, in, in typical mystery fashion, but rather unconventional real life fashion, she uh, figures out what she's doing with herself when she stumbles on a dead body and ends up having a mystery. <laughs> um, and so this, this story, this is the third in the series, and it basically continues her her coming into herself and and figuring out who she is in this new life. Um, so it deals with, you know, her family relationships, her relationships with her friends, her romantic relationships. But at the center of it is, of course, a mystery. There is another dead body. There is another <laughs> mysterious death. Um, and this one's a locked room mystery, which was a lot of fun to write. I'd never tried doing one of those before. So she is visiting her aunt and her aunt's uh, her, her aunt's companion and they uh, are going to they hear about a local sort of legend I guess about this this woman this ghost who is haunting a local manor and they're like okay well let's let's go check it out let's see what let's see what all the the gossip is about this but when they get there they discover that the the owner of the house or the matriarch of the family has died in the night and her Ooh. family is convinced that like oh the ghost did it um, but Lily is a fairly skeptical and logical person and so she she would rather figure out what actually happened <laughs> i love it and i love once again you've created a very strong feminine character you've created someone who has brains beauty um the willingness to to go where maybe someone else wouldn't go and not to be afraid um, it doesn't mean that she doesn't have skepticism here or there or she's cautious but at the same time, she's a strong, she's a strong woman and she has strong friends who are very loyal. And I, once again, I think that that is something that you've brought to fore that is so well done. And I liked that. I love her relationship with Ophelia. Thank you. I think, and as, I think this comes out in most of the things I write, um, friends that are really your found family are the people that you know, whether or not you are close to your your own, your mm -hmm. biological family, your family of birth, I think um, those those friendships where someone becomes such an integral part of your life and, and part of your identity and the way a family is part of your identity are so, there's they're something that's very important to me. And so I think that ends up reflected in a lot of my characters and a lot of my writing. Um, and I, I really... I think it's very easy to write about the importance of a biological family and how your parents mm -hmm. affect you and how your your siblings affect you because you know we've we've all been there in terms of how those relationships <laughs> uh, us and you know either help us grow or prevent us from growing. Um, but I think for for 
in so many cases, the importance of those friendships and those those found families can get overlooked. So I really like having having those for my characters also. As a reader, I enjoy that as well. And someone who highlights authors, it, it means a lot to me because you are right. I think that we have so many influences growing up. It's that, you know, nature versus nurture. And, you know, nature is where we wind up. Nurture is what we get. And if we, so many of us have gotten a lot of wonderful nurturing growing up. Some of us needed more than what we got for whatever reason. And that found family is often where we get that. That found family is also the kind that sort of pops you on the back of the head and says, okay, you went too far or that's not right. Because it gives us a barometer of what we what we have to come. That is one of the things that I love about Lily and Ophelia in this. They have a little tiff in the book and yet they realize who they are and what they mean to each other. And then Ophelia has a redheaded husband named Ned and I love that. <laughs> I also love Ophelia and Ned's relationship as well. It's, it's different and they navigate it so lovingly and easy and it is in a time that their differences might be shunned they sort of put the world out when it comes to that and they move forward and i love that as well thank you i think you know like you were saying about uh you know, friends who are willing to call you out and i think in a lot of ways it's easier to hear those moments from your yes. friends than from your family because you know if a parent talk says like you know you went too far here it's really easy to that's my parent. That's my parent. <laughs> I don't know what they're talking about. But when your your friend who is going through all these these life stages with you and really sees sees so much of you is close enough to really see the core of who you are is like you need to stop and uh, <laughs> you know you hear that in a different way and I think that's one of the reasons those relationships are are so meaningful. Um, and then in terms of Ophelia and Ned, they are they were a very fun couple to write. This was the first time I've really gotten to sort of explore their relationship. Um, and I wanted it to feel different than the other couples that I'd presented in the series. Um, because they, you know, they are an interracial couple at a time when that was not unheard of, but it was also not common, especially for more upper class couples. Um, there, there are some very you know, significant historical instances that you can point to and say that's that's an example of of when that happened. But it just, I mean, it obviously just wasn't as common. And there's not as much in terms of research to to look at for interracial couples in the early 19th century. Um, so a lot of it was, you know, writing them was inferring what would these dynamics have been like for them. Um, but I also I didn't want to lean too hard into that because I wanted them to really be in a relationship of equals. Um, emotionally, if not socially, because in, in early 19th century, you know, you, you look at basically any marriage, whether it's an, an interracial marriage or not, and just legally, it's not a relationship of equals. But I wanted, I wanted the emotional core of it to really feel like, okay, these people are on equal footing. But also, they're very young. <laughs> you know, it's like 20 years old, Ned's a few years older. So you get that you know, you're, you're just barely past being teenagers, but now you're married and you're figuring it out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and something that you mentioned that uh, doesn't give anything away, but the matriarch of the family, Mrs. Wright, she inherits from her husband when he dies. Mm -hmm. So just talking about that, you know, that class system and what, what was expected at the turn of the century and what was allowed. Um, so Mrs. Wright inherited a fortune which was unusual. Because yes. typically it would have passed through the son rather than the wife. Right. She's uh, she's given sort of custodial charge of the, the family fortune, which would normally have gone to the son and sometimes was legally required to. It sort of depends on the uh, sort of the terms of the property. Sometimes you, you would look at your own property and say, I have no control over who gets my house or who gets right. you know, this bulk of my, my money. Um, because it's legally required to go to my male next of kin. Um, this, you know, if, if anyone's read any Jane Austen, that pops up a few times <laughs> in there. It's called, um, the property being entailed, it's entailed on the male uh, line. So to undo something like that, if you wanted to leave your property to someone else, um, you know, it took an actual act of parliament. Like you had to go through 
the basically the federal government to be allowed to leave your own property to someone else because that idea of things passing through the family and through the male line of the family was so important um, socially and, and economically. That's how the system was propped up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, um, it, it gave you, it gave you a lot less freedom, but it also really, it supported those social structures that were very much about like male, male primacy and, you know, the, the idea that here is the core bloodline of the family and that's what's important not necessarily the person who's going to be the best person <laughs> to right, not right. necessarily the person that you most want to leave your assets to you know you there gets back to that idea of like found family or the person yeah. supposed to marry or the people who are important to you and your family that might not be you know your your heir or your next in line um that wasn't in terms of the social structures, that wasn't as important. Um, so I really wanted to lean into showing, even though, you know, maybe maybe legally, maybe economically, that's not as as primary in terms of people's day to day lives. Like that still was very important. You know, who who were you close to? Who was the person you trusted? And I think there again is you know that points to Lily, who is a single woman now that she's widowed. And she has strength and a voice. And it would have been, I assume, a little off-putting to some people that a woman would simply ask questions directly because that's not something that went on. So, yeah, the, she. Um, one of the reasons that Lily is a widow <laughs> in this <laughs> in the series is that uh, if even if you were a younger woman, she's she's around 26, 27 in this in this story. Um, even if you are on the younger side, the fact of having been married gave you a little more social clout. Um, and the fact of being widowed gives you a little more social freedom. So yeah. that gives her a little more leeway to, you know, poke her nose in where she wants to <laughs> <laughs> associate with the people that she wants to without, without raising as many eyebrows. You know, there, there would have been eyebrows raised. Um, and, you know, there's definitely points where I play a little fast and loose with maybe what what would have been allowed and what would have happened. Um, but, you know, there is always that sense of like, she's, you know, she and Ophelia are trying to figure out what's going on yeah. and they're, they're investigating, but they have to do it very carefully because yeah. there are other people who are in charge. <laughs> like it. Well, um, yes. It, and, you know, when you, when you rush into a situation, you're trying to figure out the mystery and this is really does point to real life. I mean, you really have to be careful because if someone has been murdered, it's not so hard to do it a second time, at least so I've heard. <laughs> tried, but <laughs> me, I haven't tried. So, I will say I want to celebrate Eliza and Susan. Um, I I saw such a connection between Hitchcliffe and Murgatroyd in Agatha Christie, and I absolutely loved them. I just I love the fact that Lily ends up visiting her aunt mm -hmm. and her aunt's partner and that is just so delicious. It was really fun writing Eliza and Susan because she Eliza had been mentioned in previous books. It's Lily's father's sister and they've been mentioned as sort of estranged. <laughs> Lily is close to her aunt but her father is not. And Lily also has a very rocky relationship with her father, which is part of why she's become close to her aunt, who in many ways became that supportive parental figure in her mm -hmm. life when her father was not so supportive. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was, it was a really, um, it was, it felt very affirming for Lily as a character, but then also as a writer to, to present this, this woman who is, you know, she's not required to be, to be there for, for her niece, but she wants to be, you know, she's, it's, a, it's a, well, again, it's not technically found family because they are related, but it still has that same feeling of like, here are the people that I choose um, to, to build these relationships with. And then you have Susan who is, is not related to Lily at all. Um, you know, she and Eliza have, have been living together for years for most of Lily's life, or at least half of Lily's life. Um, and, they have known each other for even longer, but Susan isn't related to Lily at all. But she still she still also fills that role of an of an aunt in her life. Um, and I love that you mentioned Hinchcliffe and Murgatroyd because they are uh, they are one of my favorite pairings in Agatha Christie. Um, and I just I mean, first of all, Murder is announced as such a a great book. It's so much fun. Um, it but, is. It is. It is what it. 
Marple is my favorite compared to Perot. So, you know, and the fact that she only got eight books still sort of miffs me, but you know what I'm saying. So Lily has to at least have nine. <laughs> you, you have a goal, Catherine. <laughs> Well, you, can, you can go ahead and talk to my publisher. Thank you. Right. <laughs> I, and I know who that is, so I will help in that regard. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm a big Marpo fan, too. I think she is my favorite of all the Agatha yeah. Christie Blues. I agree. One of the things I also want to point out is this book has a lot of inclusion of people of different races. And it is set in a time where we don't often see that as being the case. I do celebrate that. And I appreciate the fact that you, I don't want to say went out of your way. I, you just included, you included different people and you see different perspectives and different points of view. It's not just class as far as uh, the Lord of the Manor and the housemaid. It's also people within the village. And that was that was wonderful to read and to to experience. And I thank you for that. Well, thank you. I think when it comes to sort of our vision of what we would consider like period drama or period books, we've, um, you know, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of movies out there that I love very much, but they present this very narrow slice of life. Yes. You know, if you look at any like Dickens adaptation or Austin adaptation or, you know, something like um, the miniseries North and South, like it's all, you're looking at a very narrow section of yes. the population and it's a, it's a, you know, there's, there's no queer characters. There's no characters of color. Like it's, you know, it's all wealthy people, you know, you see yes. servants in the background, um, but unless it's a very deliberate, like upstairs, downstairs story, they're not you know, the, you know, the housekeeper doesn't get a name, <laughs> you well, know, the doesn't get a name. They're just there. Um, yeah. So in, in writing this, I really, I wanted to make sure that the people who would have been there were there essentially, you know, yes. it's not, you know, you look at somewhere like, like England and, um, you know, slavery was, was legal there up until the end of the 18th century. Um, you know, they, they did a little better on that front than the U.S. did, but you know, once. But not 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 so not far like, out. By like so many years, like, you know, like <laughs> years or so, and you look at, you know, okay, so they they ended slavery, at least in, in England itself. The the British colonies were a slightly different story, but then, right. you know, here are all these people who used to be enslaved. They didn't disappear. No, <laughs> no, that's there was a, there was a movement um, to a sort of re repatriate is the wrong word, but the um, allow people to return to Africa, I guess it sounds terrible phrasing. No, that. no, but I think you're oh, right. And, and maybe, know, but <laughs> yeah, but, but maybe we'll even say to force repatriate. Yes, there is. Because was, it's not just you're free to go. It's more like, should we, we put people country. on a ship and send them back? Yeah. And it is, so you have done that. So you've you've brought in some people, and we get to meet them, and right. they. Some of them went went. You know, we're we shipped back to Africa. That was terrible. Um, but a lot of people weren't. You know, people stayed in the country. They became servants. They became members of the clergy. They became tradespeople um, once they were free to do so. Yes. They were members of their parishes. You know, they're they're in the census records. They're in the art. They're. They're there. And just because, you know, like the 1995 BBC Pride and Prejudice doesn't show any, <laughs> any black people in England doesn't mean they weren't there. You know, just because there's there's no lesbians in Jane Austen explicitly. I don't know, there might be a Precisely. <laughs> they're, they're still there. <laughs> so uh, you know, the, I, one of the things that I really enjoy about historical research is having the chance to to find Yes. You know, all those people in history who have maybe been ignored and say like, oh, you know, that's where they popped up. They're right there. They're in the historical record. And then including that in my writing. And that part I, I do celebrate because, you know, part of in looking back at history, we also see that there are there. We know there were people of all uh, genders, uh, persuasions, whatever, sexuality, color. It doesn't matter. But oftentimes they weren't documented because mm -hmm. they were sort of an aside. Right. And, so and they, or they, they either weren't socially acceptable or they were technically illegal. Uh, but, you know, you look at something like same-sex same -sex relationships, they wouldn't have been illegal if they weren't happening. 
<laughs> and you wouldn't have laws against them if there weren't, you know, men in relationships with men or women in relationships with women. You wouldn't have had laws against, you know, uh, I don't think they they had specific term for it that wasn't cross dressing, but that's basically what it yes. what it what the laws were against. And they wouldn't have had that if there weren't people, you know, having different gender expressions. They didn't call it that, but you wouldn't have had laws against those things if it wasn't occurring. So a lot of times you can look at the the absence of something to infer its presence. Absolutely, absolutely, Catherine. I am just beyond excited. You were so right. I fell in love with Lily. It's a wonderful book. Congratulations on publication day for book number three. It's called Death at the Manor. And one day I'll learn to hold up the book correctly if I live long enough. <laughs> I hope anyway. <laughs> Oh, I am so excited. I hope you the very best of success. You certainly deserve it. And I hope, I hope you'll come back and join me again. Absolutely. I've got two more books coming out next year. <laughs> you do? Oh, well, so give it, I mean, I don't want to uh, eclipse number three, but are they Lily Adler or a there'll combination? Be, there'll be one book in the Nightingale series coming out next year. And then the fourth Lily Adler book will also be coming out. I just have to finish writing it first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that might be important. So. <laughs> Congratulations again. Death in the Manor is out today. I suggest you rush and get it. Ever how you get your books, ebooks or physical books, it's a delicious read. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Hang on for me just a minute and I'll be right back. Thank you for joining me with Out with Dan. See you soon. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of Out With Dan. You can find more information about this podcast and its host at outwithdan.com, on Twitter at outwithdan, and on Instagram and Facebook at gooutwithdan. This podcast is hosted by Authors on the Air Global Radio Network, and the theme music is provided by bensound.com. Join us again soon for the next episode of Out With Dan.